Defence Dialogue, a podcast discussing contemporary challenges in the area of European security and defence. Brought to you by the Martin Centre with Nicholas Novaki. Welcome to Defence Dialogue, um, a new podcast series by the Wilfried Martin Centre for European Studies that engages uh, key policymakers and opinion leaders in a conversation on um, contemporary issues and challenges facing Europe in the area of uh, defence. And um, today we are um, talking uh, to European Commission Vice President for Jobs, Growth, Investment and Competitiveness, uh, Jyrki Katainen, uh, on the subject of um, the future of European defence. Uh, welcome to Defence Dialogue, Mr. Vice President. Thank you very much. Um, you have the highly um, demanding and challenging portfolio of uh, Vice President for Jobs, Growth, Investment and uh, Competitiveness. In addition to this, you have taken recently a highly keen interest in the area of uh, European uh, defence policy. Uh, what has uh, what is behind uh, your interest in this uh, policy area? Uh, the technical reason for this is that uh, I'm coordinating the work in Commission uh, related to defence industry development. So this is the technical reason why I am so involved in the defence. Uh, cooperation development at the moment, but political reason is that I'm personally very interested in uh, in strengthening European defense cooperation, and and I try to encourage member states to to cooperate more in order to secure the future of our citizens. And how how have these uh, efforts to encourage the member states to cooperate more in this area uh, uh, have gone so far? Quite well, I would say, there's clearly a political momentum in our member states to put their forces together, because um, there are a few quite understandable and tangible reasons. One is uh, the latest terrorist attacks. Everybody, all the countries, thinks that they are not strong enough to address terrorist uh, threat alone. The second thing is that Uh, cyber threats have come to the picture and they are a little bit different in nature than the traditional security threats. And we have seen that even the biggest and the most powerful countries in the world are not safe from the cyber attacks as we have seen happening in the United States prior to the US presidential elections. Also some attempts to influence the French presidential elections. So this has raised Uh, the interest of member states to cooperate more. And finally, uh, all the member states have realized that they cannot afford to invest in defense sufficient amount of resources alone. And and everybody also has recognized that there is a lot uh, lots of uh, duplication in, in Europe. Traditionally, we have been talking that we have to avoid duplicate uh, or duplications between EU and NATO. But this is not a problem at all. The biggest problem is that in the EU level we duplicate everything 28 times. So uh, so these are just few examples why the defense has become a European policy or why it has come to our agenda much more forcefully than ever before. Speaking of um, NATO, um, when we talk of European defence in Brussels, uh, we, we often mean uh, EU defence. However, um, mo- most EU member states are also uh, members of uh, NATO, and I think to a lot of uh, a lot of European c- citizens, um, it, it might be a bit unclear uh, why uh, the EU is also uh, involved in the area of defence policy, since we o- o- already have uh, NATO. Why do you think it is important for the EU to also be involved in this policy area? Yeah, it's very good to clarify the situation. NATO, first of all, shares our view on uh, on what EU should do. NATO is very strong supporter of uh, of better uh, defence and security cooperation within within the EU. So the reason for this is that uh, the more EU member states can cooperate in order to invest in defence capabilities, for instance, and more we can avoid duplication between our member states, the the stronger European angle NATO has. So what we are doing or what we are planning to do 
within the EU is exactly what NATO has always encouraged our member states and their member states to do. So basically, uh, if we do joint acquisitions of defense capabilities, it is exactly what NATO has encouraged its member states to do. So we have more or less the same membership structure and the more EU countries do together, uh, the stronger NATO is. The, another point is that it's not only about capabilities, but also about policies. So uh, if we manage to deepen our crisis management activities, for instance, it uh, strengthens the European foreign policy and, and security and defense policy, which is nothing away from NATO, but uh, this is an area where NATO doesn't operate or there's a need and everybody recognizes that EU, once we have opinions on, uh, on foreign policy, we should also have muscles. So this is another way to look at the thing. There are some people who say that putting more uh, resources into EU defense means taking away uh, resources from uh, NATO. What would be your message to uh, these uh, these people? At least this is not the way NATO thinks. NATO is a strong supporter of uh, deeper uh, deeper uh, EU defense policy. I remember when I still was a prime minister of Finland in 2013, we had a European Council meeting where we first time discussed um, EU defense policy and what should be done in order to deepen the cooperation. Then uh, NATO Secretary General came to uh, or participated to our meeting and he said that don't worry, I don't or we don't believe you will duplicate anything because everybody knows that you cannot afford to duplicate anything. So, uh, so if EU member states do a joint acquisition of some particular capability, it is exactly the same capability what NATO needs. So basically, the stronger Europe is, the stronger NATO is. You mentioned um, this June that um, we have achieved more in the field of uh, uh, European security and defense in the past 12, 12 months than we have uh, uh, during the past uh, 60 years. What, in your opinion, has been driving this sudden uh, progress? There are a few very tangible uh, reasons. First, uh, member states have, EU member states have recognized that they cannot afford uh, to invest enough in security and defense because uh, defense equipments are getting more expensive faster than any other commodities. The second thing is that the nature of security threats have uh, changed or at least there are it is it has widened. Now we talk about uh, cyber security threats, terrorism, and things like that, which were not on the map or on our radar uh, a decade ago, at least to to this extent. So the nature of uh, threats have changed. This is uh, w one of the things. And third element is that that. Uh, EU integration, for instance, in the field of um, foreign policy has improved significantly. And we have recognized that once we have opinions on foreign policy, we should have also means to influence accordingly. I don't mean that EU st start attacking all over the world uh, out of the sudden, but uh, if, we, if we want to stabilize uh, some situation which we condemn politically, we might need some some means to do it, and and th this is also one of the reasons why why EU wide security policy has come on the agenda. Would you? Um, some people um, have also said that, um, um, uh, for example, ele uh, elections in, in, in across the Atlantic and and um, the United Kingdom's uh, decision to. Uh, vote uh, to, to leave the European Union or Brexit has given additional uh, impetus uh, to this area. Would you say that this has also played a role? We already started this process before the US presidential elections. But of course, uh, 
one, one can also say that uh, if the if the United States position in the world politics is uh, permanently changing, it means and it must mean something to the European countries. But um, but as I said, we started to develop, develop the European defense angle already before the U.S. elections, and and there were the reasons for this was uh, the ones which I mentioned earlier. The European <coughs> Union is currently also discussing the idea of creating uh, what has been called a European Security and Defense Union. Um, this also appeared in the um, uh, Commission uh, reflection paper on the future of European defense, which uh, you helped launch. Uh, however, the details available on this subject are limited at the moment, and um, I was wondering uh, if you could explain like, what does a European Security and Defense Union uh, actually mean and how it would increase the safety and security of European citizens? Basically, there are two angles. The first one is political angle and the second one is uh, financial angle. The political angle means in the first stage to launch the permanent structured cooperation. It's, uh, it's part of the EU treaties and basically it means that those member states who are willing to cooperate more and on permanent basis participate to the permanent structured cooperation. The areas of cooperation under this permanent structure cooperation could be, for instance, uh, capability cooperation, meaning that member states could do joint acquisitions and by doing so they could save money and, and they could coordinate the, the acquisitions together. Another possible way is to create Europe uh, is to create strengthen cyber defense and cyber security amongst those member states who want to cooperate permanently together. So those countries could, for instance, if they wish so, uh, create um, a cyber uh, joint and common cyber defense capabilities. Third element or third example could be to put forces together in crisis management, meaning that member states who are willing to cooperate in this front could plan what they want to do together and, 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 and what kind of uh, projects or, or crises they want to provide help together. So permanent structured cooperation basically is a political commitment for those countries who want to do so, uh, to cooperate more in various fields of, uh, of uh, defense uh, development. The financial angle, it is more advanced right at the moment. We have, uh, we already have a new budget line in the EU budget for defense research. It's quite striking that 90% of uh, defense research done in the EU area has been nationally financed. If you compare this to any other field of science or research, which is global by nature, uh, this is quite unique. So, so EU want to encourage uh, researchers and research, uh, researching institutions and companies to work together more than they have done so far in the field of um, defense research. The second angle here in the financial side is a, a defense fund which can finance R&D projects of uh, defense industry. But it means that if you want to apply resources for your R&D project, there must be uh, three companies at least from two countries uh, to, to participate to the same project. So this could strengthen the European industrial defense industrial development. So, in a nutshell, there's a political angle and financial angle, and both envisage to deepen the cooperation between willing and capable member states, both in the defense industrial side, but also in political side. And in, in uh, the, the most uh, concrete way, how would this then improve the uh, safety and security of uh, European citizens? In, uh, very concretely, if member states want to create 
Cyber Security Corporation, permanent uh, Cyber Security Corporation. I could imagine that those member states who participate in this corporation could develop a stronger capability to address cyber attacks. They could possibly develop joint capability to for for uh, defending each other. If one country or one company in one country is under the cyber attack from from some somewhere else, uh, the group of countries or whole EU would be more capable to defend the company or the country together. So this is one example. The second thing is uh, that our defense industry is very fragmented at the moment and they cannot afford to compete against, for instance, American competitors. So like in all area of business, there's a need for certain uh, certain type of consolidation and at least putting scarce resources together in order to de- develop more sophisticated defense capabilities. When, when launching the European Commission's reflection paper on the future of European defense, you mentioned that um, in the area of defense, everything ultimately depends on the member states. Um, in this case, uh, what can the European Commission then do to uh, move uh, European defense forward? Uh, well, uh, EU does not have uh, power in defense policy. So defense is something which is which belongs to deep sovereignty of member states unless we want to change the treaties but it will take years years now i'm sure if uh, if there is a if there's a political will to to give some, give competence to eu level in later on but uh, let's not talk about that because it's not foreseeable right at the moment but what we can do what eu meaning european commission or the european parliament can do uh, in order to uh, encourage member states to cooperate more um, we can facilitate uh, different type of cooperation between the member states and mostly in the fields of um, defense industry or joint acquisitions so we are already now using EU budget resources for defense research. We have done a legislative proposals a proposal which is now in the hands of uh, member states and European Parliament, which would open up a new financial channel for defense research and development projects, prototype uh, building projects. And and of course we can we can help member states to create new defense uh, structures. For instance, cyber defense capabilities if they if they want to to go to this area. So our role is mostly in the financial side, but also in the technical assistance side. The very last question um, we wanted to ask you is is a slightly more light light hearted one because. We want to uh, make this podcast series as accessible to European citizens as possible. So, given that I have heard that one of your hobbies is cooking, um, I, I thought I would like to ask you a question um, uh, relating to food and European defense. And the question is, in your opinion, what type of dish would best describe uh, EU defense cooperation and why? Hmm. <laughs> that, that, that's probably the most difficult question. Um, um, I would say it's uh, today's situation is very close to paella because uh, because uh, there are shrimps and, and other seafood and pork and chicken and rice and peas. It tells that um, uh, that there are all the different kind of elements in uh, in the same pot even though i love paella and and i don't want to mock it at all but but nevertheless we the security is something different than delicious food so that security would should always be more easy to understand and more more or better structured and organized than what paella is even though it's a good in food but this paella method doesn't function in security 
on that note of um, tasty food, um, I would like to thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for participating in the first episode of Defense Dialogue. Thank you very much. That was today's episode of Defense Dialogue. Subscribe to our podcasts for more.